future. They don't see themselves living beyond 30. They don't see themselves that. Why study? I mean, the dropout rate is higher than it's ever been in the United States because what's the use? They, they see the economy. Dad can't get a job. Uncle can't get a job. There's not going to be a job for me. They see the, uh, you know, or, or am I going over to Afghanistan? This is, you know, Mama doesn't want me to be a soldier. I don't either. So they, they have, but here, now, think of it. You're 19 years old, 18 years old. You're in good shape, buff. You're probably as attractive as you're ever going to be. And think of this beautiful woman or this really buff guy just gave you a little bite on the neck. And you lived forever, never growing old, never having to worry about getting a job, never having to worry about anything except maybe feeding at night. But other than that, you know, it's the, it's, it's the romantic appeal of it. Well, yeah, but if you're a vampire, you still have to have money. You have to buy the coffin. You have to keep your native soil around. You might have to travel if people find out who you are and they've got the stakes and everything and they want to stick them all, in your heart. All nonsense. That's not the vampire tradition. That's Hollywood. Hollywood has created the vampire that we see. Hollywood has created the werewolf that we see. The true vampire doesn't have to sleep in a coffin. He's not afraid of a crucifix. He can go out in the sunlight. He won't go up and smoke. See, all these are legends that keep being perpetuated, and they were all created by clever screenwriters in the 1930s and 1940s. Ho Hollywood has made it, and they've continued to do this. Well, now, if you if recall, you... did you ever read the original Dracula by Bram Stoker? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, he, 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 he was... He was not, but again, that has nothing to do with Dracula, Valve the Impaler. I mean, he just found the name he thought was neat. Well, that's the point, too. How did this legend begin with Dracula? Of course, we heard Vlad the Impaler. So, of course, when George Hamilton played Dracula, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and of course, what's your first that's name? First Vladimir. Was gone. Yeah. So that was the name. There was a character that was used to create the Dracula legend, right? No. The character came pure out of fantasy, and Bram Stoker sitting there, I'm going to call it the bite of the vampire. No, I think I'll just call it the vampire, spelled Y-R. And then he's flipping through this old manuscript, and he sees Vald the Impaler from the house of Dracul, or Dracula, and he said, that's it, I'll call him Dracula. There's no connection other than Bram Stoker thinking it's a neat name. Vald the Impaler was not a vampire. He was not a nice guy, but he was not a vampire. He was somebody who killed people. He was a mass murderer, right? He saved the Western world. I mean, he's, he's the conqueror of the hordes that came from across Asia to conquer the Western world. He really, even though he was a brutish fellow, if you put things in the perspective of history, he was really the bulwark of Western civilization against the hordes that came across the Asian plains. So basically Dracula was a good guy depending on your point of view. Now, Is there any didn't. truth, by the way, to the rumor that one of the reasons that Bram Stoker created Dracula was basically based also on his personal history, where at night he'd go off and he'd get it on with different women, and therefore he kind of made the character of Dracula a pretty sexy guy. That's when it all began. Now, the true vampire, say quotes around true, have you seen the silent film? I'm sure you have. Nosferatu? Yeah. Okay. That's what a vampire in tradition looks like. A slimy, rodent, vermin-like creature with long fingernails and ugly fangs and big, bald head with grisly membranes sticking out and big, staring eyes. Okay, ladies That's and gentlemen, if you're having dinner, stop. Yeah, that's the vampire. And Nosferatu, F.W. Murnau, the director, he wanted to film 
Dracula. But he couldn't get the rights from the Stoker family. So he just said, oh, that often happens in Hollywood, you know. He just says, I'll do my own Dracula. And he makes Dracula look the way he would in the movie, you know, as, as this loathsome creature. So when Lugosi came to the United States, they put him on Broadway in 27 in a play called Dracula. And he played Dracula as a count, as a man in evening dress with, you know, the medallion, the cape, and the hypnotic staring eyes, and, of course, the halting speech as he's learning English phonetically made him seem all that more exotic to the audience. That's when the vampire started to become a sex symbol. Now, if you had gone to the early Dracula in 1931, you would have heard screams of terror from the women who were that frightened to see this creature coming through the window of Lucy's window, coming in and taking her blood. Now if you go to Twilight, you will hear screams from the women, but they're not screams of terror, of course. They're screams of teenage lust for the hunks that are coming. And look here again. I don't know if you've seen Twilight or not. I felt it was my duty. Here you have this, um, well, I don't know how attractive either you or I would find it, Gene, but... Basically, let's put it this way. I think that David and I are closer to the original concept of Dracula, <laughs> not the modern interpretation, okay? Okay. Anyway, you see this lanky guy with soulful eyes. And uh, all the way, all the gals just scream. I know my, my editor went to see Twilight, and he's in a much larger city than I am, and he said he could, he could barely hear the dialogue. It's just the girls screaming like they did the Beatles or any rock star. So the emphasis, and then, of course, the novels of Anne Rice, you know, with the vampire Lestat and, and, and so forth. She created a romantic image of this creature that hunts for his love down through the centuries. So that's what I wanted to do in the book was talk about the real vampires. Okay, so that's the point. Now let's go move to that. From the real world, R-E-E-L, to the R-E-A-L world, is there really, other than a vampire bat, of course, is there such a thing as a vampire? There is indeed. There is indeed. Oh, I better close my windows at night. Well, I I think you would be immune to a vampire. Yes, I will. Because you are a positive person, as you said, that we've known each other since before the dinosaurs. You're you're not the the sort. I, I've I've never seen you bitter, morose, angry drunk, drugged out of your mind, drunk out of your mind, so you opened yourself up and were susceptible to invasion by what I think are these ancient, ancient parasitic shape-shifting entities that feed upon our energy, feed upon the life force, the very souls of humans. I think they're ancient, and they've always been with us. The Jewish tradition calls her Lilith, and, but she originally comes from Babylon, where she was called Lilith. The Jews added an H. And in the Jewish folklore edition of uh, the scripture, she was Adam's first wife. And from that tradition, but see, not a decent wife, not a lawful wife. So she then goes, she's banished away, and she takes her children. And that's why I call the first chapter the sons and daughters of Lilith, because they are the incubus, the succubus, that have been haunting mankind ever since we stood upright, and probably were here much before we were. They are, and they're in every tradition, the Hindu, all of, all of the various traditions, but I focus on, because I think the majority of my readers 
are from the Abrahamic tradition, which would be, of course, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And those three religions, major Abrahamic religions, all speak of these entities, all speak of the Nephilim, also call them fallen angels if you want, that, uh, you know, really don't like us, really don't like us, and defy the Creator and say, we're, we're not going to bow down to this naked ape that you think is so neat, that you think is the apex of creation. We're the apex of your creation, and that's when the great war, the great spiritual warfare for human souls began. Hi, this is Timothy Green Beckley, otherwise known as Mr. UFO, reporting live for the Conspiracy Journal. And we have a special offer for the listeners of the Paracast. Want to receive our publications for free? Conspiracy Journal and Bizarre Bizarre sent to you via snail mail. And all you have to do is email me at MrUFO at WebTV.net. That's MRUFO at WebTV.net, and we'll send you two of the most exciting publications. But we do need your actual address because these are physical publications, and you'll enjoy all the latest articles by some of the leading researchers in the field, as well as up-to-date information on the latest book and videos, and it's all for free. Or drop us a line, Mr. UFO at webtv.net. We want to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our forums where you can talk to fellow listeners and Gene and David. Just go to theparacast.com and click on the forum links. That's the forum links at theparacast.com. You've entered another dimension. You've entered the Paracast. We have Brad Steiger joining us this week on the Paracast. He's author of a new book, Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. And we're talking about where the vampire myth originated and why there may be real vampires out there sucking your soul, I guess, right? And your blood. <laughs> well, that's the point here. These parasites, they suck blood too? Yes. We look at the cases that I have in the book, Richard Trenton Chase felt that he had become a vampire, San Francisco area. When they finally were able to track him down, went into the small apartment house type situation where he was living, they found every bowl, plate, eating utensil, and of course the mixer, coagulated with blood. They opened the refrigerator filled with jars of human blood, body parts scattered around his room. The Jeffrey Dahmer case. There's another case mentioned that he thought he was the son of Satan, killed his parents, drank their blood. There are, I have the, uh, the gangs, the gangs that roam and their automobiles across the country, seizing small animals, teenagers, and again, conducting sacrifices, drinking their blood. Now, often when the entity leaves them, they are totally confused. I did that. It's as if then, and what I theorize and what I state in the book, is these ho they must have... Well, they can materialize a body. They are paraphysical beings, I believe. But basically, they need a host. They need a human host. And they move from host to host to host. 
one of the cases I have in the book is is a female entity who claimed this is um, well, it's quite a lengthy story. So young, pure-hearted Baptist boys, boy who never took a drink, never really went out with the boys. Thinks one night, oh heck, you know, I'm going to be one of the fellows, and they're in this bar having a drink, and so they welcome him, they've teased him, they've been on his back, but hey, you know, welcome to the human race. And after they've had a few drinks and having laughs, in walks this woman with a dark veil, and you can't see much of her body because she's kind of sheathed in a, a gown sort of situation, but they can see her eyes. And from the look of those hot eyes, there's a hot bod underneath. So the guys start making a play, but, you know, our, our hero just sits there kind of shyly. But she rejects his friends and says, you know, come with me. He gets up and follows her into the darkness. Okay, the guys begin to look for him. Did they go down to the river? Did they go here? They can't find him. Finally, he comes home. And remember, he's from a strict Baptist family in the South. His mother hears him in the bathroom come home, and she thinks, oh, I better go kind of run interference because if his dad wakes up and finds out that he's coming home this late, it's, it's not going to be a pleasant sight. So she knocks on the door and says, are you all right? And her response is that of a female voice saying, get the H away from the door, you rhymes with which. They leave me alone, and she's totally shocked out of this strange woman get into their house. When they finally demand that the woman comes out of the bathroom, it's her son. And this situation then went on for months. He went now, wait a minute. Is this the son acting like a woman? He is speaking like a woman. He is saying he is a woman. He's asking him, you know, to leave him alone, let him go on his way. Eventually... As I said, this, this went on for months. They took him to a psychiatrist, couldn't get anywhere, wouldn't talk with him. He was institutionalized for months. Finally, the institution says, we can't do anything. He's abusive to the nurses. He's, he tries to catch birds that land on his windowsill and eat them. And they had to take him home. They got a, a male nurse to come in. Well, the first part, he sounds like Mr. Renfield trying to eat animals. Well, we call it the Renfield syndrome, but this wasn't the case. There is a Renfield syndrome, uh, which psychologists psychologist recognize. But in this particular case, Jane, it, it's more like the possession I was referring to. Because eventually they, they managed to get an anthropologist, archaeologist from the college, and he says, uh, you know, the, the entity inside the young man rails at him, and he says, you know, that is a very old Arabic dialect he's speaking. So he happens to know a medium in town whom he really feels is reputable, has a reputation for integrity, and perhaps in this case equally important, she's been in the Mideast for many, many years and speaks a number of Arabic dialects. Fortunately, she speaks the same dialect as the entity does. And that's where they learn this incredible story of a woman who claimed that she was blooded in Egypt and has gone from century to century possessing bodies she prefers to be in a woman's body, but this was such a, she thought it'd be a kick to get into a young man's body who was pure of heart, so to speak. Even a man yeah. who was pure in heart and says his prayers by night, That's become right. a wolf when the wolfbane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. You know, they're actually remaking, or they did remake, oh, yeah. Wolf Man, which yeah. supposedly will be released eventually some year. It's going to be released in February. It was going to come out in September. Benicio Del Toro. Well, I think it'll be good. Also, of course, Anthony Hopkins plays his father. He plays the role that was originated by Claude Rains in the original movie in 1941. That's right. That's right. The interesting thing there is how they are expanding it. I think it's going to be... The Wolfman, you know, itself is a very brief movie, but that, again... It's completely what you recited, that old bit of folklore. 
they decided, you know, at this point we need something kind of sounds like folklore-ish. So Kurt Cedio and I, the screenwriter, just sat down and wrote it. <laughs> that's, that's, and that's where the tradition of the silver bullet comes from. That's where if you were bitten or scratched by a werewolf, you become a werewolf. All that's Hollywood, Gene. None of it is authentic. If you are bitten by a werewolf, if you are attacked by a werewolf or someone under the psychosis, believing he's a werewolf, you don't become a werewolf. You become dead. You are ripped to shreds. And it's the same way with a real vampire. Those under the psychosis of a vampire, as I mentioned, Richard Trenton Chase, he horribly mutilated the bodies and took their organs and took their blood and sometimes took their heads. So he didn't so, become like the converter. He didn't just bite somebody on the neck no, and no, they that, become that, basically a vampire, a way of spreading the wealth no, or spreading whatever it is. No, so no. how do you become a vampire then? You're not bitten by a vampire. It's because you're nuts or possessed? Well, first of all, I think this is the point where we recognize the contemporary vampire community. And there are many people who live the vampire lifestyle. Now, you know there are no secrets on the Internet. So word got around that I was doing this big book on vampires, so I received an email from one of the leaders in the contemporary vampire community saying, oh, I hear you're working on a vampire book. Is there anything I might do to help? Which I thought translated means, you know, what are you saying about us? Well, they turned out, the, the complete vampire community, obviously I don't mean every single member, I mean the leadership, let us say, to be extremely helpful in uh, creating this book. They had recently, just this April, conducted a survey of the vampires in the United States and around the world, how old they are, what ethnic group they come from, what state has the most, what country has the most, etc., etc., and allowed me to use it, to reprint it completely in the book on the vampire community. Okay, a vampire community. Fun. Okay, let's let's go into this. We understand about individual people who do crazy things. The vampire community, where are they? You know, do they happen to come into your local diner and ask for some true blood? What goes on? Well, I know there are many living in your community. <laughs> oh, so I think I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm leaving, ladies and gentlemen, on a jet plane. No, ser seriously, you would not recognize them. This, this may be, oh, I, no, I almost said your attorney, but that turns into kind of a bad joke. Uh, th this could be people you meet. But on the weekend, let's say, they enjoy dressing up as authentically as possible, looking like vampires. They have their clubs. In other words, they like to... It to be Halloween every day of the year. And who yes, but okay, they dress up in a weird way, maybe, or just a way that's kind of fun. Well, what, what some people would consider weird, but they consider in, you know, they have a cape and the women dress up seductively like vampire or whatever. Now, there are the sanguinarians who do exchange blood, but on the percentage level, they are the lower number and then there are the majority are psychic vampires that with consent steal or exchange psychic energy from their partner now many people have worked in an office and know the truth of there being a psychic vampire on them. because you know you there's some people you go around you just ah, you suddenly feel down now, that's when a psychic vampire takes the energy without asking, takes your psychic energy. Okay, they, so the vampire in the real world as opposed to the real world, as we said before, they don't drink your blood, they take your energy. The exchange of blood drinking is very minimal because if you drank a pint of human blood, you would die. Our stomachs are not uh, adjusted properly to be ingesting human blood. Animal blood, yes, but not human blood. So what they will do, Gene, is they sometimes wear a little razor around their neck, and they will just give a little nick in the 
well, wherever they want, the shoulder, the generally not the neck because you can hit the <laughs> jugular vein there, but the shoulder, the arm, the hand. And then they just sip a little blood. They just exchange blood. Those are the sanguinarians. And then some people mix it up. They're mostly psychic vampires, but they're also sanguinarians. Now, these are just average citizens. These are just, well, I think a good comparison is, is like the Civil War reenactors, where they try to be as completely authentic in their uniforms and, and their weaponry and so forth. I'm sure you're aware of them. It's growing around the country. And these are vampire enactors. And they love the lifestyle. They consider themselves vampires. They consider themselves, again, not, they don't sleep in, well, maybe some of them sleep in coffins, but they don't believe that they're going to live for hundreds of years, though I do have an interview with a woman who claims she has lived for 3,000 years. You know what, let's talk about that in a moment. Business travel is a profitability killer, you know that. So do more and travel less with GoToMeeting, the easiest, most affordable online meeting service. With just a click, launch sales presentations, training sessions, product demos, or collaborative sessions right from your desk. GoToMeeting is so easy to set up and use, you'll have your first meeting running in seconds. Plus, hold as many meetings as you want for one flat rate. Free VOIP and phone conferencing included. Try GoToMeeting free for 45 days. For this special offer, you must visit www.gotomeeting.com slash podcasts. That's www.gotomeeting.com slash podcasts for a free trial. This is Leslie Kane, and I'm with the Coalition for Freedom of Information, and you are listening to the Paracast with Gene Steinberg and David Biedney. We have Brad Steiger, and he's author, raconteur, lecturer, a man about town who learned in the Orient the incredible secret of how to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. That's but true. Sherry can see him, and she can tell him exactly what to do, right? Right, right. I can't believe I said that she, without she's, loving. She's Margot, and I'm Lamont. Okay, but seriously, and let's look at the press release here because this is where we're talking about. We talked about the real vampires and everything, but now you talk to somebody whom you say claims to have lived an awfully long time. What's the story? Well, that's, again, these are the stories you listen to, and you think, well, you know, it's an interesting story. Let's include it as kind of a balance. She seems to be, um, she believes, certainly, that she is a vampire. Like so many, uh, you, it, it's amazing how many people embrace the vampire lifestyle. I mean, the numbers are growing. And why wouldn't they, Gene? Because they see Twilight, they see True Blood, they see Vampire Diaries was the other series you were thinking of on the CW. And these things keep growing. New vampire movies come out all the time where it's made so attractive. So, again, I probably would question the longevity, but she is definitely living the vampire lifestyle, as all these people do. Okay, now how old is she? Really, how old does she seem to be as opposed to what she claims? Uh, I would say probably early 60s. But... Um, Again, according to their beliefs, you know, they don't age. Now, I have some stories in the book where individuals who weren't seeking vampires or believe they truly ran into real, real vampires who were, and you know the basis of so much of my work, and we should say right up front, and I think you are picking up on it, certainly. I'm dealing with the vampire as a supernatural being. I mean, I think that's apparent from the stories I, I, I've been telling thus far. So they feel they have encountered, whether it was a manifestation, a materialization, 
a paraphysical representation of a vampire, one of these ancient entities assuming human form. But these are some very eerie stories written by people who seem to me to be, or told to me, I should say, by people who seem to be solidly based in all other ways, who feel they had some narrow escapes with entities who look, well, I deal with the whole chapter with spirit and mimics, who have assumed human form but weren't human. But this was the guise they were wearing. This was the masquerade they assumed to apprehend the victim. Now, obviously, I'm going to have to put on my PowerCast hat here. And David's not with us today, so I'm going to put on the hat anyway. How does one take all these claims, all the people you've talked to, and go about verifying them to see if it's not just a story? Well, I have a chapter on that, of course. We And I have how you might recognize a loved one, a friend, who has been taken over by one of these parasitic individual uh, beings. And I caution, you know, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's go to the doctor. Let's go to the psychiatrist. Let's see that it's not some type of schizophrenia. There is the Renfield syndrome. Now, I suppose we should explain who Renfield was, and he was the lackey of Dracula, and he's the one in the movie, in the movie, who, of course, says, you know, flies, 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 and, and tries to eat them, uh, so he is that, I mean, he's reduced, uh, rather than human blood, he has to get insects. Now, he starts out being maybe a representative of a real estate company or something right. who goes to Dracula right. Castle in Transylvania and basically to make arrangements for Dracula to move. Right. And then Dracula decides, well, since he's here, I might as well get a little benefit out of it. I'm hungry. And that's right. how it happens. And that's in the novel. Of course, in the book, in the movie, they change that, of course, and, and uh, combine characters, and we just meet Renfield at, while he's in the asylum. Originally, it was Jonathan Harker was the one who went there? I forget. Uh, in the movie. In the book. In the book, it's Renfield. Right, but Renfield didn't go to Transylvania in the original book. That was part of the movie. There was somebody else who actually went to Transylvania to meet Dracula. Well, that, that's Renfield, and that's where he becomes enslaved. Ah, okay, okay. Back on the ship with Dracula. But in the movie, it's Jonathan Harker, so they can move the story along. Yeah, they actually, you know, it's a big, sprawling book consisting of diaries <laughs> yeah, and everything, and they made it into a 70-minute movie. Right. And a lot that's, of stuff isn't there. Now, the Gary Oldman version, interestingly, is uh, more accurate yes, because I know. we see Dracula turning into a wolf, and Dracula is both a vampire and a werewolf. You were asking earlier, you know, about in 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 the tradition, the old tradition, it is very difficult to distinguish between the two. In fact, they they have that overlap. So, in what they would do on Broadway on the play is they would throw a German shepherd on the stage to indicate that Dracula was now a werewolf. Just a little bit of trivia there for trivia buff. Okay, well, yeah, they have to compress the story. It's never the same thing. I thought Gary Oldman did a really, really good job. Of course, now he is Commissioner Gordon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, uh, I suppose, um, and the Christopher Lee versions, as long as we're talking here, uh, Christopher Lee brought, I think, raw sexuality back into the vampire movies. There you had, you know, the several brides of Dracula, you know, the, the buxom, shapely women who followed him around. And uh, he himself then was a kind of a overpowering Dracula. The uh, Gary Oldman also wore a mustache, which in the original Dracula, Dracula has a mustache. So the, the, in a sense, the Coppola version with, with Gary Oldman follows the book a little more closely. Okay, and of course, we all like Christopher Lee. He, I guess he's still performing, isn't he? Yes, he he's is. He's, what, 87 years old or something? Oh, I, yeah, at least, at least. 
I mean, it was incredible. And you listen to this guy talk, and he's so well educated and so distinguished. And I, it's unfortunate that he hasn't been interviewed more often, especially when he was younger, because, you know, you see this image on the screen, this very serious, erudite English gentleman. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But away from that, let's get back to the authentication. So how do you authenticate a claim that I'm a vampire, I'm a werewolf? How do you do that? Well, first of all, as I said, except for the vampire community, who uh, I have to be uh, diplomatic here, they would not say they're imagining. They would not say they're game playing. They say, now stick with me on this, Gene. They would say they embrace the vampire lifestyle. I think that would be a correct way of saying. So as much as possible, even though they might work at uh, McDonald's during the day, but as much as possible, they embrace what it is to be a vampire, to have that type of headset, to be completely at one with the classic, what they consider the classic image, which we are saying now is probably more the image created by Bram Stoker and Dracula. They surely do not dress up and look like Nosferatu. They do not look like vermin. They don't look like hideous beings. They try to be as attractive and sexy as possible. Then there are those, and the vampire community will say, if you encounter anyone who says he must kill people, and drink human blood, then you have encountered a psychopath. You have not <laughs> encountered a vampire. Because a vampire, as we are defining it in that sense, is simply a very, very ill human being. Jeffrey Dahmer is a good example of both a werewolf and a vampire. He starts killing small animals as a young man, and drinking their blood. And of course, we know he ended up with a compart an apartment filled with vials of human blood, with human heads, and uh, was in the process of cooking his meal from a human body when the police burst in on him. So we have both that. And this is a point that I want to make that is so seldom brought out. If you truly study the serial killer, they really have a little bit of Hannibal Lecter in all of them. They don't consume the whole body. And, and this will not make the newspapers, but if you talk to law enforcement officers, if you really get into it, you find that they do take a souvenir. They might take a thumb, they might take a finger, they might take a a uh, portion of uh, a bit of flesh over the abdomen, they might take a thigh, they might take a toe, but they do take some part of their victim and they do cannibalize their victims just to that degree, some to to greater degree like Jeffrey Dahmer and, and several others. But I think without exception, and of course I can be corrected on this, the serial killers that I have studied all take this Trophy is probably a good word, but a trophy that they will eventually nibble on or consume. So if people are eating their dinner now, they might want to push their plate aside for a while. Proceed. I thought <laughs> maybe I knocked you over with that. But this is something, again, when you truly begin to research these aspects, you can see why many of these details are not made public. But... Psychologists now do recognize the Renfield syndrome, and they, fear is often mentioned as and called the vampire's disease, but it's not truly when you become a vampire, but these people, you know, become very pale, they can't go out in the sun, their eyes will become red, and they give the appearance of the classic vampire. Now, I have a story where two roommates who just got along famously, and they had been friends for years. One is a big ox of a guy, and the other is a small, kind of classic, nerdish kind of individual. But they're, they're really good friends. The 
large man has porphyria, and he then sees that this troubles his little buddy, and he starts saying, you know, I am a vampire. And he says, oh, come on. No, I am. And he tells stories, and it gets deeper and deeper. And he frightens his roommate so much that when he has his back turned, the little guy clubs him unconscious, drags him into the bathtub. He knows he's not strong enough to carry his roommate, who weighs around 300 pounds, and he dismembers, cuts the man up in the bathtub into numerous sections, carries him the pieces out one by one, and then scatters them in various places around the countryside. Now, that's... This is like the TV show Criminal Minds. Well, where do criminal minds get their stars? You know, from this is an actual case. I could not use the names. The attorneys would not let me use the real names in this chapter. But it, you know, it's in the chapter called Don't Boast If You Think You're a Vampire, because I have a couple other cases where one woman, she loved Dracula and the whole Mythos so strongly that she changed her name to Alucard. Oh yes, before we even have you discuss that. Fake Magazine is proud to be celebrating its 60th anniversary and its 700th issue. That's 60 years of bringing you true reports of the strange and unknown. Fate brings you the latest on all aspects of the paranormal, like angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, and much, much more. It's bigger and better than ever. Subscribe now by calling 1-800-728-2730 or online at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730 or www.fatemag.com. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. You're in the Paracast with Gene Steinberg and David Biedney. You never know what's going to happen next. Brad Steiger joins us, author of many thousands of books, including Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. Okay. So this woman goes by Dracula backwards. Right, right. And of course, Alucard. John, John Carradine played uh, Dracula, spelled backwards, Alucard, in one of the Universal uh, series that they did. You know, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Right. And also, and also, Lon Chaney Jr. played Dracula. Right. As the son of Dracula. Mm -hmm. And that was the name he used. You are correct. She changes it to Alucard, and again, the same situation. So don't boast if you think you're a vampire, because some people, with especially now, with all the incredible programs, the incredible run of programs, someone might take you seriously, and they might take out the stake. Now, I have also a chapter where people wouldn't be chuckling at all at what we're talking about, and that's in some of the villages of Romania, where they still believe intensely that vampires exist. And, and very, here again, we have to, it's a difficult, there's so much, Gene, so just allow me to jump back, way back, you know, to the 12th and 13th century. When the vampire myth was at its peak, generally, the vampire attacked primarily members of its family because the grandson wakes up and says, I had this really strong dream of a grandpa last night. You know, it's as if he were alive. And then the family says, oh, wait, let's check him over, check him over. I think there's a little nick. Oh, my gosh, he's, he's coming back. Now, this was an intense belief at the time. So the... You know, a group of men troop out with the priest, and they see. And remember, they didn't put them in coffins necessarily and bury them six feet. The six feet came later. So 
the body had begun to swell of natural decomposition. So the earth is kind of broken open. And they look in, and of course they see, and we know this does happen, that Grandpa's fingernails have grown. Maybe his beard has grown, because we know this can happen after death. So they say, oh, my Lord, Grandpa is a vampire. So they run a stake through the heart, remove the heart, burn it, mix it with water, and drink the ashes. Now, this is still going on in villages of Romania today. And a group of men was just sentenced last year, the last couple years, for doing exactly that. And they do it regularly. There truly are vampire hunters in this in the smaller communities. But even in the larger communities, people wear the crucifixes and are very cautious about what they say about vampires. And I've received emails from people who are either Romanian or had Romanian roommates when they were in college and say, this is true. They take it very seriously over there. So a group of individuals were sentenced because of all people, this kindly school teacher who had served the village for years, they began to, this one family began to dream about him and had dreams and then one of them claimed, oh, I'm getting sick and I can't move. I'm getting... And they said, oh, look, look how pale she's becoming. And, and, oh, I think, oh, look at the marks, you know. And who, who? Well, I'm dreaming of Professor so-and-so. And they said, why is he after us? What did we ever do to him? Well, that, that's beside the point now. He's coming and he's taking her blood at night. So they all marched up feeling completely righteous in what they were doing. They dug out the body, took out the heart, burned it at a crossroads. That's an important thing. Burn the heart at a crossroads and then drink the mixture of ashes and water. And that's exactly what they did. And they had been doing it, groups, individuals, uh, for centuries. For centuries this has been going on. So, again, belief in the classic vampire. See, again... This was not a sex symbol. This was not a sexy guy coming to bother. This was the ghost of a recent, fairly recently deceased school teacher they felt was a vampire. And when they were being interviewed, one of the women in town, one of the men in town, or excuse me, several of the people said, of course, this is what you do. This is the right thing to do. I had to do it with my grandmother. I had to dig up my grandmother and, and perform this because my grandmother was coming to me and taking my energy. So what we might consider, you know, as being strictly the, the devices and instruments of fiction are very real to many people. Then I mentioned the one in Iran where they did a public hanging of the vampire. So they're in every continent, they're in every country, they're in every village, and now, of course, they're on every TV screen in the United States. Vampires. Let's move back to the werewolves that we mentioned briefly. Of course, again, Lon Chaney Jr., who played Son of Dracula, was famous for being Larry Talbot, the Wolfman. And, of course, the legend, as we mentioned before, was something that was created out of whole cloth by a science fiction and fantasy writer for that movie the legend and everything the silver bullets and all that stuff. right all that all okay that. in the real world the world of our reality what are werewolves well i know you remember my werewolf encyclopedia and i feel very strongly about the wolf i'm a adopted member of the seneca wolf clan I communicate almost weekly or bi-weekly with several wolf clan members. And to the Native American, the wolf is the great teacher. Now, throughout all of history, the wolf has been the great teacher in whatever country. We who come from Europe are also members of tribes. We tend to forget that. And many of us, you know, the original name is wolf or bear. Or we had totems exactly the way the Native Americans do. In the beginning, quote, quote, we all wanted to be wolves. 
Our species survived because we bonded with the wolf. The Andertal did not. Homo sapiens did. We adopted their hunting patterns. We adopted their sense of social interaction. We adopted their, their communal structure and their cooperation to hunt in packs. Neanderthal didn't do that. It stumbled around, tried to be individual. We realized the one basic human component that makes us uh, truly human is cooperation. And that's what the wolf pack does. The wolf pack, though, has a hierarchy. It has a leadership. So we copied that, too. We have a leader. We have a chief. So there was a time when we all wanted to be wolves. And then, of course, as we progressed and became more civilized, we looked upon that. If you act like a wolf, then you, it's socially unacceptable in, in a community. But there still is that wolf within each of us. Now, of course, we think of the wolf in the modern age as someone who maybe goes after women a little too right. eagerly, especially if he's married. That is true. That that probably came in, oh, I guess in the 40s, calling a man a wolf who was sexually a predator. But we all wanted to be wolves. We danced around the fire, acting like wolves, going out on the hunt, behaving like wolves. And then in the 12th century, with the Inquisition, people who felt they were shape-shifting into wolves, which they had been doing for centuries, was suddenly considered satanic. And if you were shape-shifting and believed you turned into a wolf, well, they had a nice big stake and fire waiting for you on the edge of town. Not a silver bullet. Not a silver bullet. Okay, silver. believing that you shapeshift, so let's move into the shapeshifter, because the werewolf is part and parcel of that. How do these legends begin? Other than, of course, the vampire. The vampire can become a wolf. Mm -hmm. But what about people? Now, for example, in the TV show True Blood, the guy who owns the diner, he's a shapeshifter. But he can change shape into anything, not just a wolf or a dog, but a common house fly, <laughs> a bull with horns, you know. This gene is an integral part of our psychic makeup. The shaman of old and today believe they shapeshift. When we all wanted to be wolves and we were dancing around the fire before the hunt, we all believed we became wolves. The idea of shape shifting is integral to animism and magic. And it's the basic, uh, the shaman shape shifts to fly above as a crow. The shaman shape shifts to go to the land of the grandfathers. This is part of our collective psyche we have that within us and, and we use it today what do we name our football teams and our basketball teams i mean we name them after animals what do we how describe ourselves you know oh, i'm hungry as a bear or i'm grouchy as this or that we just it is so much a part of who we are and no matter how we dress it up and disguise it and try to rationalize it it's who we really are. Okay, so we basically, in some ways, worship the animals because we look to them in terms of our personality traits. We follow the wolves' social structure, for example. On the ancient cave paintings in France, we see half-man, half-animal paintings. So we know for at least 20,000 years we have believed this. We believe, and probably, uh, okay, how many saints, and you, you may not know this, how many saints also have their animal counterpart? I mean, even St. Francis, you know, the most uh, benign of entities, is sometimes represented as a wolf. We have others. St. Michael is represented. Jesus is represented as a lamb. So we have used, for at least 20,000 years, we have used animals as our representative in the afterlife. It's as if that portion of our cells, the animal cells, is 
we cannot go until the way has been paved by this animal aspect of ourself, which is not looked upon as evil in all cases, but is looked upon as benevolent and even holy. Hmm. All about the animals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, before we move to hour number two, let's briefly tell everybody about this book that recently became available. Give us a one-minute description about it. You're asking me to do this. I am going to let you do it. I'm not going to do How it. How can I limit it to a minute? <laughs> anyway. I'll tell you what you got a minute and a half. <laughs> But it's going to be 59 right. seconds if you talk too long about doing it. Okay, well, real, real vampires, okay, I'm saying that are not the undead returning from the crypt and so forth. And I'm saying they are entities that may look like us and when it might serve their purpose, they impersonate us in order to deceive us and prey upon us. But they have never been human. I say that real vampires are parasitic, shape-shifting entities ancient entities that feed upon the energy, the life force, the very souls of human, and every, every religion, every culture recognizes the vampire and recognizes this threat. So we've got to watch out for it. It's called Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. And we're going to look at those Night Stalkers on the other side of the Paracast. Gene and I love to hear from our listeners. If you'd like to share your thoughts with us, Send your messages to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to check out our website at theparacast.com, where you can download past episodes of the show for free and visit our dynamic discussion forums. Also, please patronize our sponsors. Tell them that you heard their ads on the Paracast. They'll appreciate it, and we will too. Welcome back to the Paracast with Gene Steinberg and David Vietti. We return with Brad Steiger, author of millions of books, and not just millions of copies of books, but so many that I can't count. And the latest one is Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. And you've talked a lot about vampires, werewolves, shapeshifters. What, pray tell, is a night stalker other than the name of a twice-failed TV series? Oh, and I love that series. The um, Night Stalker... There are entities, there are creatures, there are phenomena, whatever you want to say, Gene, that I have been tracking for decades now, and I don't know what category in which to put them. One, and this many people are saying this is the chapter that creeps them out the most, are the, what I call the lost boys, the, the boys with the black eyes, the black-eyed boys. Have you, have you heard of this phenomena? Tell our listeners about it. This is very strange. These are what appear to be young teenage boys, maybe 17 at the most, all the way down to, you know, the, the preteens, 10, 11. And there can be anywhere from two to four. They appear at your door, knock on the door and say, um, hey, can we come in? <laughs> well, you don't know these guys. And you say, well, you know, well, but please, please, you know, we have to use your bathroom. Can we come in and use your bathroom? And you're thinking, what? And then we'll phone. Just let us use the phone. Well, we'll phone and have someone come pick us up, you know, we're, or we're kind of lost. And can we just please come in and use your phone? And they keep on with this pleading. And then, you know, the people are sometimes, you know, they, the woman is kind of touched. There's this. 10 year old looking up, you know, like a little waif with a kind of little pout on the lip, you know, I'm hungry, I'm cold. But there's just something not right about them. And then you notice their eyes are pure black. Now, if you make the mistake of letting them in, <laughs> you're going to have a hard time getting them out. In fact, you are probably going to leave and have to call the police from wherever. And, of course, by the time they get there, your house is virtually ransacked and destroyed, but there's no sight of them. The people who don't let them in will look out after they think they're gone just a few seconds, minute, and there's no sign of them. They have just disappeared. They look down the block if it's a 
They come in the daytime as well, but mostly at nighttime. They see the street lights. They can see for several blocks. They've disappeared. So I began receiving these kind of accounts, as I say, a number of years ago. The first one I got, I, I included in the book because I think, well, I shouldn't say the first one, but one of the first, because I thought it was particularly eerie. And put yourself in this situation. You're with your, in this situation, the, the, the young man was with his fiance. They were living together, and they were out with a couple, they were his friends. They were out for a little bit night on the town. They stop at a park, and uh, there's a bunch of teenagers. And one of them gets a little apprehensive because, unfortunately, you know, when we see a group of teenage boys, our society has come to that. So they're a little nervous. And, and then they see the boys are waving in a friendly way. The guy, the main, the man who's narrating this, says he knows right away that they had black eyes. And he says, let's, let's get out of here. He says, and then there's his girl says, well, they're coming to the car. You, know, just, you must know them. You must know them. They wave. He says, I don't know them when we're getting out of here. And then he said, you know, did you see that? They just had totally black eyes. And then they laughed and now they just had those little sunglasses, you know, those little round ones. So, no, no. So they, they go to the restaurant where they're going to eat in the middle of town. They come out and hear these boys again. And they're just sitting kind of on the curb, and they just kind of wave at them. They said, what is this? How did, how did they know we were going? How did this? And one of the girls says, come on, you guys are putting on the joke. You know, how, how could these young guys know? You, you must be setting this up. No, why would we do this? So they say, okay, let's go to a movie. Let's go to the movie we've been wanting to see. They go to the movie. They come out a couple hours later, and who should be there? But these boys. Now this is getting really creepy, really freaking out the the other man. But the girl is kind of skeptical. She says, "You've got to be doing this, but why? You know, why are we doing this?" And and so you say, "Okay, okay, we're going to this new night spot on the edge of town. That's just miles from here." They go there. They're in for a couple hours. They come out. Who should be across the street? But these boys. Well, that's enough for the one couple. One thing still thinks it's some kind of sick joke, but the guy says, I just want to go home. So the narrator and his fiance go back to their apartment. They happen to be on the bottom floor where the big stoop is right out in front. They're not home more than two minutes, and there's a knock at the door. They look out the peephole, and there are those boys. Now this has really become stretched the borders of reality. So he says, what do you want? Well, we just want to come in and use your phone. You know, the same dialogue every time. I don't going to let you in to use my phone. Well, come on, man. We want to call and have someone pick us up. No, no. Well, can we use your bathroom? Little guy here. The little guy really has to go. Go find a public toilet. You're not coming in here. And they keep on and on. You know, well, just let us come in for a minute. You know, it's kind of chilly tonight. Just let us warm up and we'll be gone. No way. By this time, his fiance has called the police. The siren, and they start to hear the siren coming. Or see the police car. And the boys run from the stoop. After a couple minutes, he steps out. Again, it's a clear look with several street lights. They've completely vanished. So this is the kind of account that I've been seeing. What category do you put them in? Are they vampires? They certainly are night stalkers. What's their agenda? What are they after? What kind of, I mean, is this some uh, experiment? Maybe By some stupid kids hoping to make a score. Yeah, but think of how they would know where these two couples were going all over town and be waiting for them when they came out. Indeed. The other thing is, what is the spiritual component of the fact that if evil comes to your door, it can't do anything unless you physically invite it in, say, yes, please come in, motion it, 
If not, they can't enter. Is there something about that? Actually, that is probably one of the very, very few metaphysical precepts and warnings that is probably true. But remember, it's not just by knock, knock and opening the door. You can invite them in by exhibiting anger, envy, jealousy, greed, arrogance, and especially when you're stoned, when you're drunk, when your normal cautionary preceptors are down, when you are vulnerable, they can enter. And that's what I'm saying. These entities, they prey upon human weakness. So maybe what these entities were doing was just fear. They were putting fear into these people. And certainly if they opened the door, you know, they probably would have really injected fear and then maybe taken possession. But I'm getting more and more stories of these black-eyed boys, and it's always boys. And it's always um, like young teens. Young teens like what, 15, 16 years old? Yeah, like at the the oldest, maybe 17 down to just the preteen, you know, maybe 10, 11 type of thing. Okay. And they're always totally aware of where you are, where you're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's say when they're stalking you. So that's the night stalker category. Okay. Now that's the big question here. Are there situations where they were actually invited in? Or maybe those people didn't live to tell the tale. They lived to tell the tale, thank God. At least the accounts I have. But they had to leave the home because they just threatened them, became obscene, became uh, destructive. And the couple, an older couple, because, you know, the woman looked out and saw a poor little boy out there. Just let him in and use the bathroom, George, for Pete's sake. And they had to leave their home. They had to flee for their lives, they felt. And they called the police then from a distance. And when the police got there, uh, the, the, the home was demolished. The home was, uh, everything was tossed around like it had just been uh, shaken down. But the boys weren't there. Hmm. If they had stayed and tried to struggle, I think, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think they did the right thing of getting out of there. Okay, what about any other instances where they were allowed to come in? Thankfully, people have just, I I think it has a lot to do with uh, our cautionary times. You know, we are reluctant to let any strangers of any age into our home because we pick up the newspaper every day and read, you know, someone's gone on a rampage and shot eight people here and 10 people here, and I mean, we seem to be living in, I think we would all agree, a very chaotic time. You raise an issue here, and I wanted to ask you about it. Are we seeing more instances of violence of this nature, or is it because of the 24-hour news cycle? The fact that we, of course, have the cable news networks that need stories, and so incidents that might have maybe warranted coverage in the local press suddenly become national and worldwide headlines. There has to be a truth to that. And way back when you first met me, when I was still teaching journalism, I would say, and that's been quite a while, as you say, before dying. Hundreds of years, before they invented journalism, before Walter Cronkite was born. Right, yes. But I would say to students who would ask that, I said, well, it's because, you know, there are more reporters. We now have, uh, at that time, of course, we didn't have Internet when I was teaching. But I said, you know, we have wire services. That was the most advanced then. We had wire services and and, uh, telephones, and and we're able to communicate more, and we pick up more on what happens in the small towns instead of just concentrating. I would go into the history of, of journalism where primarily the newspapers dealt with just the activities in their cities unless it was time of war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm not so certain. I think it is a reflection of the chaos, the confusion, the general melee that people feel about these times. And I, I'm, I'm afraid it is increasing. Are you ready to order the official Paracast t-shirt? You asked. 
We answered. We're now taking orders for the official Paracast t-shirt. It comes in white, 100% cotton. The front of it features the same logo that we have on our community forums. On the back it says, Separating Signal from Noise. To order the official Paracast t-shirt, here's all you have to do. Visit our new online store at store.theparacast.com. One more time, that's store.theparacast.com. You can use a major credit card to place your order for the official Paracast t-shirt. This is Philip Rodno. You're listening to Paracast with Gene and Dick, one of the most informative shows out there. So listen closely. We have Brad Steiger. He's author of a new book, Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. We talked about one kind of night stalker. Are there others? Well, there's one I've been researching for a long time, and I couldn't find anyone for the, for, oh my goodness, but probably 10 years to know what I was talking about. And I call those the spirit mimics. And I think on the previous program, I may, may have mentioned the spirit mimics to you. These are entities that you might sit down and, and uh, you know, you're, you're on the road, you're traveling, maybe you're in the West, people are friendly here in the West, to the West, someone, a stranger sits down and talks to you and suddenly kind of asks some personal questions that you're not comfortable answering and then, then you really start to look at him and you see that he's dressed maybe just a little not peculiar. He made it a little old fashioned. And there's something about even his features, maybe it's a little waxen. He's not quite there. I mean there's like ninety six percent of him is there. But there's something just off. And maybe you've been just putting some of his language off to local colloquialisms and local vernacular of the region, but now you have to start saying that some of the terms, you know, are really outdated. I mean, and where where does he live, you know, in some kind of other dimension, and you may have hit it. More of these stories uh, I'm receiving from people and, and uh, from all walks of life, Gene, and from all kinds of backgrounds, so from service and then preachers and media people. Who, who recognize these creatures or these entities or these semi-people, spirit mimics, who, again, what's their agenda? Okay, well, the okay. point is here, are they something alien, interdimensional, whatever, or just I think so. stupid, foolish people who want to act weird or can't help it? I mean, that's, that's what I would think if I let's say when you first sit down. I'm an open kind of guy. You're an open kind of guy. If someone sat down and you're traveling, start talking, you probably engage him. You know, you're a very verbal person. But then you start to notice, you know, that it's just something a little bit not. At first, it becomes uneasy. You start to say, well, what is this about this guy? Now, what I have been receiving to just add to this, Gene, is people who stop at really neat little roadside diner. And the people that are, again, you know, you don't know if it at first because you're hungry for a hamburger, a bowl of soup, or whatever. You start to notice the people around you, you know, that they are looking at you a little bit peculiar. Well, that's something, you know, if you're, you're a stranger in the area. But then you notice the little boy in that corner table looking at the comic book is just kind of flipping the same page over and over again. People who come up and talk to you are friendly, but yet they, again, some of the questions they ask you know, are just, what, you know, and, and, and it just seems to be out of time and place. Saw a story from one man who went through all of this and then got the very creepy feeling that he wanted to get out of there. He decided on his own, because he was a salesman going back and forth, he says, I'm, I'm going to find that place again and see if it was just me or if, you know, a local aberration or what it is. And he can't find the place. Now it's just an empty patch of meadow in the forest. This happened to be in, in the northwest. Nothing but trees around. 
And he asks, he sees a logging truck, stops, asks them, what about this place? Never been a restaurant there, never been a gas station there. I got an interesting report from a, a serviceman. He was really down. He just got out of the Air Force. He had been injured uh, in a helicopter accident. And he thought, what is there in life for me? And he was from New England. He just took off and went all the way across the country to Texas. He stopped, got gas, saw this nice little mom and pop diner. And it was just like, you know, just the classic epitome of motherhood behind the, the counter. And uh, ordered the pie, ordered a sandwich. And she says, why are you so down in the dumps? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have a job. I don't know what. I, I just took off. I'm, I'm just. And she says, "Well, what uh, branch of service?" So she explains, "Well, you know." And she mentions an aircraft manufacturer in that city. I'll bet they're looking. In fact, I know they're looking for uh, employees right now. They're looking to fill certain positions. Why don't you check it out? So he did. He got the job. He settled down in this Texas community. And it wasn't until maybe three years later, he says, you know, I, I have been remiss. i got to drive on the edge of town. i got to thank that lady. I mean, she really lifted me up when I was f so far down, you know, the bottom looked like up to me. Goes back and, again, he's told by the gas station where he stopped for gas, there had never been a diner there. There had never been a restaurant there. So as he asked me, what was this? Who was this motherly figure? And how do you answer that? Was she an angel? Was she somehow this is this was definitely a benevolent being because it gave him the, the advice that changed his life, that gave him hope. And again, I can go on and on with these kind of accounts from you know very serious, rational people. And we can't assume then they were making it all up, which is what the skeptics would say. The skeptics can assume all they want, you know, but but these are stories that happen to people. There's no reason. They don't want uh, fame and glory for telling their story. They have read a book or they've heard me on air, and, and they share their story. I had an experience like that, and thank God you, you know about it. Other people know about it. I'm not crazy, and this is a story I'm going to tell you. This is an interesting point. Have you ever had an experience of this yourself, Sherry? Anyone you know? Oh, yeah. 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 And I think uh, <laughs> many people have said, you know, we bring it on because of who we are and our lifelong experiences that, you know, maybe we attract some of these situations. And that may be true. And I accept that. Because I have seen, as as you know, entities ever since I was a small child, and in fact, before I went to school, because I grew up in the country, uh, I, I didn't really see many other children until I went to school, and I didn't realize that everyone didn't see the people you know around us in the room. And then, of course, you learn to not announce what you're seeing. You learn to be quiet. And you learn to, to deal with the situation as something that uh, doesn't make you special. It just probably makes you a little more aware. These experiences throughout life, not only preparing me to be a paranormal researcher, since I've had these experiences all my life, but they have allowed me to be more understanding and more sympathetic to people who have had experiences that other people might consider weird or strange or, and receive uh, disapproval, I'm, I'm able to listen with, with greater understanding. A little bit more sympathy because you've had it happen to you. I haven't met too many weird people except for, you know, you and Jim Mosley and David Biedney and, <laughs> you know, Alan Greenfield. What about Tim? What about Tim? Tim Beckley is the weirdest of all. You know, he is right, Mr. Weird, right. not Mr. UFO and Mr. Weird. Seriously. <laughs> You know, we all bow to Tim Beckley. The other part of the book is creatures from the dark side. Other than werewolves, give me some creatures. But not here personally. Well, Just tell me about them. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes people receive strange visitations after interviewing me. So, you know, be prepared. 
And I know you will be. I have a, a chapter on vampires and UFOs. And people will say, what? You know, but come on, you have been with us since the very moment when we were beginning to explore. And we know some of the cases in South America. We know some of the alleged abduction cases in the United States. And some of them really were, I think, expressions, the same entities, because they could, they manufacture and I don't mean mechanical, but they create the illusion of a manufactured object. They create the illusion of it being a coming from a far distant place. When I think they just step through a hole in another dimension, and they have victimized, they have taken blood, they have abducted and sexually molested individuals. And we're not talking about the classic abduction cases, which I think in, in many cases, you know, we can think of several reasons to explain them, which we need not now. But I do denote some cases in which I think it's the same beings, the same paraphysical entities, you know, that probably exist in a space or a dimension where they can enter our dimension, they can enter, and, and you know, whether this is string theory with its 10 dimensions or a 4D or 3D or 6D, but when we first talked about dimensions and paraphysical entities back when we were very young, everyone raised an eyebrow. Now, of course, with quantum mechanic physics and other physicists becoming interested in other dimensional paraphysical realities, this becomes much more acceptable. Okay, so now we're interpreting it, again, in a way that seems to fit our society expectations, though. Isn't that part of it, too? We see UFOs today because we live in the science fiction society, the scientific society, right. and maybe we saw more werewolves and vampires at times when we didn't have the science to influence our thinking. There's always that aspect of it. And, you know, if you're going to be an objective researcher, which I try to be, you have to concede that part of it is the zeitgeist. Part of it is the spirit of the times. And because we now will interpret them, just as you have said, my friend, many of the ancient entities, they are the same beings, but they assume a guise that is contemporaneous with their victims. Now, that's based on the assumption here that they are all evil. Yeah, they aren't all evil. But but the ones I chose because, you remember, I'm an old English teacher. Limit your theme, limit your... <laughs> so this book deals with the bad guys. Sherry and I have uh, a number of books about the good guys. But this book, Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side, these guys aren't so nice. Okay, so in that's fact, the point here. How do we know? In fact, stay away. <laughs> How do we know they're really evil? And the reason I ask you that is because some of these people may claim or entities or beings may claim to be doing something good. Yeah, they do. They do. And that's the oldest guys in the world, isn't it? Now, the ancient alchemists, the whole plan that they had was to make the angels obey them. And we see that today, you know, with, there are books, you know, have your angels help you win the lottery, have your angels do this, do that. Well, that, that's not the concept of the true angel. That's not the function, the mission of the true angel. So the people who are still employing alchemy, commanding, controlling the angels, are just as deceived as the ancient alchemists were because they will play along for a while but then of course their object is to take the soul to take the energy from the individual so we have a lot of people who are whether they know it or not alchemists thinking that they can control this i should say an alchemist mindset is what i meant to say thinking they can control these entities and of course they can't Fate Magazine is proud to be celebrating its 60th anniversary and its 700th issue. 
at 60 years of bringing you true reports of the strange and unknown. Keep up with the latest on angels and miracles, psychic phenomena, ghosts, UFOs, life after death, and much, much more. It's bigger and better than ever. Subscribe now by calling 1-800-728-2730 or online at www.fatemag.com. That's 1-800-728-2730 or www.fatemag.com. What are you waiting for? Your fate awaits. You've entered another dimension. You've entered the Paracast. We have Brad Steiger, author of a new book, Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. And we're exploring the dark side. So these creatures are evil. They want to take our energy. They want maybe to kill us, whatever it is, take our souls. How do we know this? We have uh, several thousand years of testimony, descriptions, accounts. It's the same situation as, as anything that we study historically. And I basically, whether it's the conspiracy book that Sherry and I have written or this book, I take the approach of the historian. I'm, I'm presenting what has happened in this book. I'm giving an interpretation, but I'm really going back to ancient scripture. I'm going back to ancient volumes. I'm going back to the record of humanity as it has evolved and progressed spiritually through the ages and seeing how these entities have interacted, preyed upon us, exploited us for centuries. Okay, so how do we fight them? We fight them by staying in the light, by being examples of peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy to other people, generosity, truth, compassion, faith, all these redeeming aspects that truly make us human. We employ these devices, which should be and hopefully part of an integral part of our spiritual evolution. These are the things we certainly in this troubled times we should be practicing. And this is how we defeat them. This is how we keep them away by truly being totally and truly spiritual human beings. Okay, so looking at the sourcing of entities like this, we can talk about interdimensional or just another race of beings who coexist with us? How do we know? Maybe from another star system. I accept all that. I accept all those, and, and I deal with all those in the book. I cannot definitively, but those are the three sources that I name uh, from another dimension, from another uh, space, a little pocket in time and space, and another uh, uh, area of the universe that somehow has found a conclave, a dimension, a, a place to hide and exploit in our dimension. I should tell our listeners that the method we're using for networking, we're calling Brad on a regular landline telephone, old-fashioned telephone, the kind that's supposed to sound good all the time. And the sound quality has been, in some cases, covered by digital haze. We've had to call them back two or three times. And, of course, we can be paranoid and say, you know what, maybe they're listening to us. We can indeed. We can indeed. All right. Away from paranoia, give right. me another story about some creatures from the dark side. One of the warnings that I try to emphasize in the book is people who trifle in the occult, modern-day alchemists who feel these entities can be used, can be employed, can be made to obey. 
And I have a story in there which I really think is, is quite sad of a young couple who embarked upon their marriage with the greatest of expectations, with the greatest of hopes. And the young woman just could not leave alone her dabbling in the occult. Now, I'm not criticizing our many friends who are psychic sensitives or mediums and so forth, but she she just approached it with kind of the attitude of a teenager with a Ouija board. You know, she hadn't quite studied thoroughly enough, completely enough, or seriously enough to really know what she was dealing with. So in this case, she began to believe that there was an entity that had followed her through many, many past lives and was coming to reclaim her. And she became very paranoid. She became feeling that this demonic entity was ruining her life, was torturing her. Now, the husband took it, you know, with a grain of salt and didn't believe a word of it. Uh, felt that his wife was ill, that she needed help, tried to get it, but then whenever they he would try to engage a health professional with his wife, she would then be just as normal as blueberry pie. And I don't know what's wrong with him because he seems to have this strange, and in other words, just manipulated the whole situation. He was skeptical. They threw out it all. They had children, boy and a girl. And then one night, the entity materialized in their bedroom. The husband was completely horrified to see this demonic entity, complete with wings, complete with the whole number. And then he realized, you know, that something truly had attached itself or, in his opinion, her dabbling in the occult, not thoroughly, not studiously, not with the proper attitude, had conjured this being. He, the entity, uh, tore up through the roof. It was solid. He tried to get his gun and and, uh, shoot it. Uh, as if that would have done anything, probably. His wife was just, uh, you know, hysterical. And uh, as I say, the sadness of this is she had become so permeated with the seeds, you might say, the psychic seeds sown by this entity, that she really was beyond help. She is in an institution today, The man, as he said to me, you might think I'm a coward because I saw this as the only thing I could do. You might think, you know, I'm I'm a weakling. I should have faced up to this. But this is beyond my capacity to believe, to intellectualize, to rationalize. I saw the thing. I heard the thing. The thing tried to attack me. And he said, you know, by way of, I guess... (laughs) trying to garner empathy that he visits his wife as often as he can, brings the kids so they can see her, and he hopes that she will return because she she had just lost her entire mental capacities. And so throughout, I, I issue, I hope, several cautions. Uh, you mentioned, do they ever, anyone ever let the black-eyed boys in? I do have one case where no one let him in, or I should say, excuse me, the parents knew nothing about it, but there is a knock at the door, and there is a little boy, and their daughter let him in. Now, they didn't realize this for quite some time. They heard their daughter talking to someone upstairs, and whenever they'd come up, they'd see nothing. And she'd say, well, that's my friend. You say we should always be friendly to people. We should always, if people don't have anywhere to live, we should help them. So he doesn't have anywhere to live. So I said he could live with me. And I think, you know, okay, this is the imaginary friend syndrome. But eventually it grew to the point where, you know, they they thought, well, we'll get her a puppy. You know, maybe that will distract her. 
the entity killed the little puppy, and that's when they they realized and saw, and they saw with their with their own eyes this black-eyed boy materializing in the corner of their little girl's bedroom, and they had to resort to you know an, an, an exorcism. I have a story of of a woman uh, again. This was recorded and of a woman who was a dibuk was attached to her for decades claiming to be her uncle now we know that in the jewish faith it isn't common to do exorcisms but you know there's not just one jewish faith there are many many segments and many aspects and there are those rabbis who will conduct an exorcism and i have step by step of of the practice and and how it would be done i felt that the roman catholic exorcism we've we've read about so much and and we've detailed it so much i thought it was time to put a jewish exorcism in and how they were able to rid this woman you know after decades of being possessed by a dibuk or an entity that claimed to be her uncle it's interesting here i could give you a lot of jokes about rabbis conducting exorcisms, but mm-hmm. we know how it's done by Catholics. We've seen the movies, we've read the books. Right. How do they do it in the Jewish religion? Can you give us maybe a few basic details? Well, here it's it's done, you know, with a group of uh, a large group gathers, and the blowing of the horn and the uh, it's more persuasive. It's not you know repeating over and over. It's more of um, a process of, uh, I would say, um, trying to debate and trying to, in that sense it's very similar, trying to reason with the possessing entity that it must leave, that it must do the right thing. And then there are a group of uh, 12 uh, fine, upstanding uh, Jewish gentlemen who uh, also gather much in the tradition of, of a Christian uh, de- deaconate uh, where uh, several uh, leading members of a, a synagogue would gather around and then there's the blowing of the shofar, the horn. There, there are a number of um, kind of classic uh, uh, Jewish uh, holy instruments involved, and it's it's kind of you know all the same. They kind of wear down the entity and convince him that he has done wrong and that he must leave. And it's a situation that or, or, excuse me a process that can last days or it can last hours. In this particular case, you know it, it was done in, in a few hours after she had been possessed for so long. It was just a. Uh, um, Again, this is a, a case, this is a true case. Some of the names have been changed for obvious reasons, took place in on the East Coast. And I I felt that we in in my ever increasing attempt to show that we are all one <laughs> regardless of how we want to identify ourselves politically or religiously at the heart, we are all one. We are all spiritual beings. We are all walking a path that I pray is toward our spiritual evolution. Ray Perkins, a reclusive veteran burned out from the Gulf War, lives tortured by relentless, perplexing nightmares. Nightmares of a horrific battle in deep space and of a mysterious woman suffering in agony for her devastated world. A woman not yet born, calling across centuries to him. Then, a coincidence leads him to his destiny, his chance to alter the universe. Attack Attack of the Rockwells. The former fiction editor for Star Wars and Indiana Jones, Robert Simpson, writes, The soul of the novel Attack of the Rockoids lies in its heart and passion for building a convincing tale of a love that spans the galaxy. A thrilling story. Attack Attack of the Rockoids is available now. Read a sample chapter and get a special discount off of the cover price at our website, rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com. Attack Attack of the Rockoids, a novel in the grand science fiction tradition. This is the Paracast with your 
hosts, Gene Steinberg and David Biedney. You never know what's going to happen next. We have Brad Steiger, author of Real Vampires, Night Stalkers, and Creatures from the Dark Side. Now, in a lot of the cases where things go wrong, it's because we open doors we should not have opened. Like you take a Ouija board, and it's a great parlor game. But then suddenly you contact something that maybe isn't so friendly. You start reading too many occult books. Maybe you see different spells that you could try, and you try them and you bring forth something. But this is also classic in the movies. How many horror movies, science fiction movies, an innocent human being dares to question the gods and they engage in some behavior. All sorts mm -hmm. of TV shows. Look at Warehouse 13. It's almost every episode is somebody finding an artifact yeah. by basically looking under carpets, looking through doors, opening windows, checking things they shouldn't check. How do you know? Right, right. It calls for a process, as I indicate in the book, of constant vigilance, of being constantly aware that we must truly be examples, each of us, of working in the light, walking in the light. As I said, entities, uh, uh, look at the way you always sign off, peace. I mean, just the very fact that you sign that way shows again that you are an individual that truly tries to practice and want peace, love and hope and benevolence and empathy. If we, have, I, I, I am so distressed right now, Jane, of the hatred that I see. I mean, I, it, these we have right now uh, groups that, that I think we seem to be regressing, walking around with placards. I mean, certainly protest is a part of our democracy and the whole process, but these are signs of hatred, animosity, and, and certainly I don't think that brings good on a people. I, I think, again, we must practice benevolence and empathy and generosity, compassion toward our fellow human beings. And that's the greatest protection I know against any entity, occult, metaphysical, vampiric, or other negative entities. Now we look at entities who claim to be benevolent. They say, you know, we're here to spread the message of peace and brotherhood it comes through all societies all cultures ufo contactees met these benevolent creatures why should we believe them or should we believe oh, them we shouldn't by their works you shall know them and we have to always remember that the great teachers of all religions have advised us of that we have to test them test the spirits uh, just because they land, as I said to me, uh, certainly, I mean, if I, I want to be welcoming, if that great getting up morning occurs and the entities come from outer space, and, but you know, again, we have to test them. And that doesn't mean we have to shoot them. That doesn't mean we have to threaten them with our little weapons, but we have to test these entities. Because how do they come now? You know, you and I have been studying this since, uh, you know, as you said, before dinosaurs. And we've gone through all this contactee situation. And we've, and if, they're, if they're really approaching our civilization in peace, why do they just come to a few people at a time out in the fields, out in the woods, out on the, while the person's fishing? I think we have to question, why don't you go to, to the right people? You must have been surveilling us long enough to know who's in charge here, and it isn't a fisherman not on a dock. You know, we, we have to always test, because these are the classic situations that are found in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran. We find these things repeated over and over, these kinds of tests and these kinds of uh, entities appearing 
and promising things. You know, it's a, it's a false promise that usually ends up with the person enslaved. Ooh, that can be dangerous. Well, that can you, be just totally tragic. And how do you know? Oh, absolutely. You know? And, and the question uh, is also, I wonder, we have now, as we've talked about before, when we get back to the UFO world, we have these people who say, you know what? We want disclosure. We want to know what's going on. Do we? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I, I try to stay uh, as active and, and sympathetic. I, I find, to my great distress, that the UFO field, now forgive me, but I find that just as... Uh, Self-attacking, uh, uh, criticizing, ridiculing, uh, demeaning, attacking personalities as it ever was. I, I certainly find the metaphysical or the paranormal field a whole lot friendlier <laughs> than I do the UFO field. I, I think it's the it's same as, as when we started uh, and I'm saying we as if we started it all, but we, we almost did. You know, we, we were at the beginning of this great interest in the field. But as Tim Beckley says, you know, that that was the golden age back then. Uh, now it, that, that nothing new has been learned. Uh, cases, I, I mean, one one website even called for. Uh, the death of Jerry Clark and myself and so forth because we're the old guard. Now they will do it right. And when I continue to monitor, they're, they're just taking the same old cases and chewing them up and spitting them out over and over again. This is a field where it doesn't seem to progress. At least the nuts and bolts aspect is dying down a little and people are recognizing that they too. It has nothing to do with the outer space hypothesis. No one is saying that there cannot be life in the universe. But at least, you know, 99% of what we're witnessing on this earth are either multidimensional beings or they're experimental craft from our own secret laboratories. we got to watch out about those secret laboratories, my friend. Yes. Hmm. So, <laughs> who wants to be involved in the UFO field anymore? I kind of understand that, you know, because there is so much argument around there. And even when you try... You make an honest effort, and I think we here in the Powercast make an honest effort to figure out what's going on. You we certainly rag do. For it. You know, we're Calvinists. You know that. We're, you know, we're cross burners, whatever we are. I don't know. <laughs> well, you certainly do make, I think, probably the strongest effort of anyone. And uh, keep at it. Indeed. I know it may not make it may not make you the most popular kids on the block, but at least uh, you're serving the cause of truth. In my opinion. Well, it's a hard job, but someone has to do it. And we right. don't have much time left, so maybe we should start looking into your near future activities. We know that you've been on this planet for a while, and we expect you to be on this planet for many, many more years. So I would do. you tell us, in our waning moments, waning very rapidly, what stuff do you have coming out? What's your next book going to be about? Well, we have, uh, I know we tried to get together on this and we appreciate it. Our, our Real Miracles, uh, book is out, uh, which I, I hope you've seen. Beautiful cover and filled with hundreds of, uh, remarkable stories. And then I couldn't resist, I couldn't resist when the publisher mentioned it to me. Because what's next to vampires? What's the most popular thing we see in all the movies? Hundreds and hundreds of them. So the next book is Real Zombies. Wait a when minute. I re well, stop, stop, stop. Real Zombies. Okay. So other than the movies about zombies, are there real zombies? Let's maybe do give a quick preview. How do you mean give real zombies? Okay, when I wrote, and I don't know if you remember this one, the pictorial history of the Hollywood monster film, Monsters, Maidens, and Mayhem, 
I wrote that in 1965. I didn't even include the chapter on zombies because there there weren't really any. There's only two. One with Bela Lugosi, which is quite good, White Zombie, and then one by the famous director of Al Luton, who who also did Cat People, which was successful. But otherwise, there just weren't any. Until three years later, 1968, George Romero comes out with Night of the Living Dead. And he admitted that he he kind of uh, was greatly inspired by Richard Matheson's I Am Legend. But he didn't want to make them vampires, but he wanted them to be monsters. So he just said, you know, what if one night the dead just got tired of being dead and got up out of their graves and started... And now why they would start eating their, their relatives or the other people, it just... It makes it horrible, but does it make it rational? But from that time on, zombies are a result of a great virus or some kind of disease or radiation that falls from God knows where. But yes, there are real zombies. Okay, so radiation or some kind of illness... They're real zombies in the sense of what? That their brain cells have died or what? That there are individuals who can create zombies, who can turn individuals into mindless beings to serve them. They used them greatly in the slave plantation days. There are techniques, there are exercises. It comes from voodoo, it comes from hoodoo, the African uh, version. It, it is the, the basic African tribal belief is really very passive. But when the slave institution began, then voodoo came on the scene in Benin, Africa, and slowly they realized that they didn't have to give up their sacred jungle gods. They could just give them new names like Mary and Jesus and St. Michael. They could give them good Roman Catholic names because the government in Haiti and in South America decreed that all slaves must be baptized Roman Catholics. So the shaman of the slaves who were taken along with the people, the villagers, said not to worry. We just give them the names, the names the white man likes. And then the zombie tradition, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating, it's.